Our topic of research is net neutrality, and the question that we're proposing today is, is net neutrality an effective means of fostering an open and innovative internet? We are going to evaluate this through the perspectives of consumers, businesses, and provide some possible solutions. Okay, so first of all, what is net neutrality? Net neutrality is the principle that internet service providers, or ISPs, should not filter any content from the internet, regardless of its source. That they should treat all data and content on the internet equally and have it be equally accessible to its consumers. As seen here, where ISPs treat all the data from the web equally by allowing it all to reach its laptop, which is supposed to represent us as consumers and our devices that access the internet. Additionally, this principle also implies that ISPs should not favor or block any particular website because they want to, and should especially not discriminate differently based on user, content, website, or location. This principle was formally implemented by the FCC through Title II of the Telecommunications Act of 1934, heavily benefiting us as consumers by allowing us to receive the benefits of net neutrality, which include having access to, to all data on the internet without fear of it being blocked, slowed down, throttled with, or outright censored, allowing us to enjoy the qualities of an open and free internet. That is, until December 14th of 2017, when the FCC voted to repeal net neutrality or Title II. Even though this review didn't really get rid of net neutrality, it did, however, get rid of government regulations over ISPs, allowing ISPs to regulate themselves and giving them the power to block, throttle, enact trade prioritization, and censor some websites if they want to, as seen here, where the ISP allows some data to go through but blocks one particular line, meaning that the consumers won't have equal access to all data on the internet. On the other hand, there are some free market advocates that believe that we don't necessarily need net neutrality because if ISPs do throttle, consumers, consumers can always just switch over to different ISPs. However, according to these statistics, it's shown that only 60, 61, or the majority of the consu consumers, only have access to one ISP, meaning that if, even if they do notice something like this, they won't be able to change. This all goes to show why we need at least some kind of government regulation over ISPs ensure ISPs don't do things like this, and so that everybody can enjoy the qualities and benefits of net neutrality and an open and free internet. So with net neutrality, the internet looks like this, in which all content reaches consumers equally quickly. However, without net neutrality, businesses would be able to pay in order to have their content reach consumers more quickly, as seen on the right. Now, what this does is it creates a system in which a company's ability to pay these fees is the determinants of success rather than the quality of their services. Now, this is no problem for a large company such as Google or Facebook because they can pay these fees. However, this greatly disadvantages startups, which are a crucial source of innovation. Now, we can see this as in Facebook's displacement of MySpace, in which Facebook was willing to take these new ideas and embrace them, whereas MySpace was unwilling to risk its brand name on these new ideas. Furthermore, it, startups are significant to the economy, and as you can see, they consistently have more net job creation than older companies. Not only that, their net job creation is consistently positive, even in the 2008 recession marked by the red line. Now, ISPs tend to say that net neutrality is a good thing, but they criticize actual enforcement of net neutrality principles, and they will make claims such as the idea that net neutrality regulations will stifle investment. And they cite sources such as US Telecom in saying that their investment has decreased from 2014 to 2016. Now, when we take into account things such as AT&T's acquisition of DirecTV and Sprint's purchasing of smartphones, we can actually see that there is an increase in investment from 2014 to 2016 as reported by Free Press. So essentially, the actual impact of net neutrality regulations upon ISPs is minimal. So, now that we've established that net neutrality is essential for fostering an open and innovative internet, let's look at a few solutions. One of our first solutions is Title II, which allows, which allows the FCC to legally enforce net neutrality principles upon ISPs, meaning they can prevent ISPs from blocking or throttling the internet. This, form of, this, this kind of provision is easily adaptable because if the internet were to change, which it most likely will, the FCC can always adjust the kind of regulations it has over ISPs and the internet uh, to accommodate the needs of it during that time. This, this provision worked really well while it was around for about 1.5 years. However, it was recently repealed, uh, meaning that it's easily susceptible to change and has very little public influence 
because the majority of the consumers actually wanted to keep Title II. However, it got reviewed anyways, showing that the FCC is the one that actually has the power in regards to this matter. So here we see a quote from Ajit Pai, the commissioner of the FCC in 2017, where he is depicting his support for something called light touch regulation. Light touch regulation is a more hands-off approach to net neutrality than Title II, and is basically the self-control of ISPs with some government intervention. It should allow for more innovation with less government regulation. As we saw in the quote, it is heavily supported by the FCC and Commissioner Ajit Pai. You'll hear him refer to it as Clinton era light touch, which basically means that it was used during the Clinton administration in the past. But is this a viable solution? Yes, there are some cases in which this has worked. In 2005, the Madison Phone Company was fined by the FCC for docking some of its services to its consumers unjustly. Overwhelmingly, however, we have seen that light touch regulation has been unable to protect both businesses and consumers. In 2010, Windstream, an ISP, redirected some of its users from the Google toolbar search to its own search platform in order to push its own product onto consumers. Furthermore, in 2014, Netflix was forced to pay Comcast a large sum of money in order to get the best possible speeds for its consumers. So even though there are some cases in which light touch regulation has worked, overwhelmingly it has been unable to protect both businesses and consumers and therefore isn't the best solution. Um, an example of light touch regulations failing could be seen with Portugal. Portugal has seen many detrimental impacts with very few beneficial. For example, ISPs um, make a lot of profit as they can charge based on the services that the consumers want, as can be seen by the image. If you wanted YouTube, you pay an ex five dollars. But if you also wanted Facebook, you would also need to get the social pa package, which would be another five dollars. And using this, um, they can exploit the um, they can exploit the consumers, which would cause uh, mistrust between the ISPs and the consumers. So, legislative implemented net neutrality would be another probable solution. It would be it would be basically the legislation would control the FCC, giving them orders around, ordering them around. This would lead to greater um, permanence, so it would be more permanent. And um, a lot, the people also get a bigger voice in the subject. But this would also be really hard to pass through Congress. And well, it's not very adaptable since, um, since le the legislation and uh, yeah. So an example of legislative implemented net neutrality working would be, can be seen in Iceland. Iceland has really low censorship and also has very high consumer rates. Literally 100% of the consumers um, have access to the internet, which is also due to the low cost that the ISPs have to charge since a lot of cons they have a lot of consumers. Some cons would be, well, they have very low filtration, so a lot of illegal activities can get through, and this would cause um, a detrimental effect on the economy and the safety of the government and civ civilians. So taking all of this into account, we decided that a legislative solution would be best because we've already seen in the past that Title II and Light Touch were both ineffective. Under Light Touch, you had repeated infractions of net neutrality principles by ISPs. And as you can see, Title II simply cannot endure, and we've seen this because of from the repeal. So as such, we would go with a legislative solution. Thank you very much. Um, having finished your project, uh, Gerald, uh, what, if anything, do you consider to be the gap in the team research? And what, what would, and something that would make you feel more confident about the conclusion? Well, we went through a lot of websites and there were a lot of sources on the subject, right? Uh, and so, like, it was kind of hard, like, trying to um, match them up and find the real solution, like, the real, um, true research. So we used, like, a lot of .orgs, but, like, it, it would have been it, it would have been beneficial if we actually used the database instead of like just going through the internet. Okay. Um, reflecting on your colleagues' work, um, Ethan, which one had the greatest impact of your overall understanding? Well, I'd say Jerry's had the greatest impact because while I focus more on consumer opinions over uh, Title II and in America, Jerry's more focused on uh, ISP regulations and internet all around the world meaning I could better understand what, what kind of internet the consumers would actually want based on the different regulations implemented elsewhere. Okay. Um, 
Jonathan, what is an example of a compelling argument for one of your peers' individual reports that y'all decided not to include? So in Gerald's individual report, he had a great piece on China and how they had a really restrictive, um, really restrictive uh, internet. But we didn't include that in our TMP because we thought it was not even viable for the U.S. and therefore it was a waste of time. Okay. Um, so what was the strongest counter argument to the solution you guys came up with? So with the state of Congress, um, it's just it seems like it would be very difficult for anything to pass at all. I mean, you can see like right now they have a bipartisan agreement for immigration, but it still fails. So given that, um, it seems like it would be very difficult to implement it, but it's a better chance than either of the other two, which we've already seen have failed. All right, thank you.